I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles this morning and uh, turn to the book of John, the gospel book of John, the fourth gospel in the New Testament. And, uh, and as we just started this last week, the whole theme in this book is belief, uh, to be believing in Jesus Christ. Last week, we, uh, we began with the apostle bursting out of the gate with such an immediate and exalted and bold Christology as he so powerfully announced Jesus as the pre-existent word, how he so crucially proclaimed Jesus as the all-powerful creator, and as he urgently presented Jesus as the life-giving light. Friends, John wasn't wasting any time as he started out his gospel that as he wrote this book, remember the whole theme is found in chapter 20, verse 31, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Friends, this book is so urgently focused on belief in Jesus, about faith alone that truly saves. That is what you do with Jesus means the difference between eternal life or eternal death, there is no reality more important for you to wrestle with. There is no truth more important for you to believe and respond to that the reality and truth that Jesus is the Christ. He is the very son of God. He is the savior of the world. And so my prayer and our, our elders prayer and hope, and I, and I pray this is your prayer as well, that through our study of the book of John, that through this study, more will come to saving faith over the next year. That as you go out and you share this good news, and as you invite people here, and as we study this together and preach through the book of John, that the lost will be found, that the prodigal will come home, that the rebellious will repent, that the skeptic will finally bend the knee, and that sinners will be saved for the glory of God. And through that, that the church will further be sanctified, that we'd be further encouraged in our faith, further convicted of sin, and further captivated to believe all the more in the word, the true light and life, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we're entering this book, again, we're going to be starting in verse 6 of chapter 1. We're going to be working to chapter 13. As John just argued for the very divinity and deity of Jesus Christ on the, out, on the outset of this gospel, where he's going next here in verses 6 to 13 is to show us how the world then responded to him, how the world reacted to the truth of Jesus. And so as, I, as you and I and the world today we must still come to face to face with the reality of Christ through the scriptures. Friends, the reality of the word, the life, the light still requires a response. The reality of Jesus, friends, demands a response. And so let me ask you, as you're, as you're hearing all of this in light of Jesus, are you believing what the Bible says about him? Are you loving Christ all the more? Are you trusting in him rather than yourself? And the biggest question of all that we're going to address here today is, is, are you born of God? Are you born of God? Well, let's look at the text. First, uh, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 6 to 13. And it says this, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let's pray. 
Our Father, we come to you filled by your Spirit, covered in the righteousness of your Son. We have your Holy Word open before us. You have given us everything. We have everything we need to know about the light and the salvation that comes through the true light, Jesus Christ. And so as we have your word open before us, we ask you to speak to us. You speak to us through your word, through your written, sufficient, full word of God. And so as the Apostle John uh, is declaring to us who Christ is and what he has done, we do pray that you would produce more faith that as even the disciples asked for more faith, that, that they needed help for their unbelief. God, we approach your throne and ask for you to help us with our unbelief, that you would give us more faith here today. And we also pray for those who don't know you that might be amongst us. We do pray that today would be the day that you open their hearts to receive Jesus Christ, that you would open their hearts by your spirit through regeneration to make them alive, to make them new, that they would be born of God and that they would be worshipers of your name. And we also ask for you to further sanctify us, grow us in holiness as we approach your living word. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, as the reality of, of Christ requires a response, as the Gospel of John here continues in verse 6, he starts out by mentioning a name of a man named John. A man that, as we just read here in the text, came as a witness. And so as John, the Apostle John, is using legal jargon here, he's calling a witness, a witness into the court of law, as it were. He's, he's calling someone to testify to the truth to the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so the apostle John puts John the Baptist on the witness stand. This John who was sent by God is on the stand of the cosmic courtroom of heaven and he has come to testify. He has come to give his testimony about Jesus so that we may believe and have life in his name. And so, friends, in response to the reality of Jesus, the first right response that we see here this morning is that we need to respond to the testimony. We must respond to the testimony. So in verses 6 to 8, it starts out this again. There was a man sent from John, or sent from John, sent from God. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, it's interesting to note that the gospel of John begins with a man named John. As the name of John was a very popular name back then, and it even still is today, it seems that the apostle John wants to make a distinction about this specific man named John. Even in light of uh, one of the other gospels being written by another John, John Mark, Mark's gospel, John is identifying who this John is. It's not John Mark, and it's not the Apostle John who's writing this, but rather it's John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, as you will see as we further study this book. And so as John mentions him here, he, he mentions him kind of abruptly after he just so boldly declares, he just said, right, in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It seems that... Uh, it's somewhat abrupt, but John needs to be mentioned. This John needs to be mentioned. And so I would say even more so than just identifying him as a John amongst Johns, John is introducing him here out of some pressing importance to the original audience. And he does so to establish who this guy really is in light of Christ. In fact, scholars believe that some in the church back then had a wrong view of John the Baptist that as important as he was, they may have had too high of an elevated view of John. That they were maybe even believing that perhaps John might have been that long-promised Messiah. In fact, as you would see in verse 21 to come, some were even asking if he was Elijah who has come back. And so John's abrupt introduction here. Uh, is likely given to confront some of the wrong beliefs that were ruminating within the church 
that as Luke's gospel in chapter 315 says, as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. And so the apostle John wants to get this right and straight from the outset that John the Baptist was, yes, a really extremely important figure in the Bible, but he was not the Christ. And so he says about him, there was a man named John, a man, right? He doesn't say that he was the word. He doesn't say that he was God, but he says he was a man sent from God. He was sent from God as the prophets were of old. He was sent for a specified purpose. And the specific purpose is clarified in verse 7 as John the Apostle writes here, he came as a witness. Witness in the Greek, mar- mar- martyrian. This is where we get the word martyr from. Martyrian means to bear witness or to give testimony. And so as the text also goes on to say that he came to bear witness, it means that John came to testify. And what did he come to testify about? He came to testify about the light. To testify about what we just heard in verses 4 to 5. To testify that the word was the light of men. To testify to the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness that does not, that does not overcome it. And so we see right away here that the Apostle John is establishing that John the Baptist is not the Savior, but that he did come from God, sent by God, in order to be a witness of our Savior, to bear witness or to testify about the truth of Christ for the very purpose, as that verse closes out, that all might believe through him. Again, that's the whole purpose of the Gospel of John. That's the whole overall theme of John, to believe in his name and have eternal life. And then to drive this clarity all the more here, John says in verse 8, he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So he's restating it again. And so the question is, is why is he, why is he doing this? So as much as John the Baptist was such an important and even prominent figure in the Gospels and in our chapter to come as well. And as some were confusing him with the Christ, John sets them straight. That, that John is a big deal, yes, but John is not the light. He came to bear witness about the light. And so again, John is like a witness on the stand in the great cosmic courtroom of God. And he is testifying to the truth. He's saying, it's not about me. It wasn't me. It's him. He's pointing to Jesus. He's the light. He's the light of man. He's the light that shines in the darkness. Believe in him. So that's the testimony of John. We're going to see more of that in the weeks to come. And friends, this is so important for us to understand because, again, as John is such an extremely important figure in the Bible, We remember that John was the last prophet. If you remember the story of John, how he came onto the scene at the same time as Jesus, as he was also a baby brought forth through the miracle of God, opening his mother's barren womb. And as he was the very cousin of Jesus, as as John was announced by the angel Gabriel, just like Jesus was, and and how he was prophesied about in the, the prophecy of Isaiah, Friends, we could see how some people elevated him beyond what was right. That even as he was baptizing so many Jews, right, for the baptism of repentance of sin in in the Jordan River, many of the Jews that were coming knew these prophecies and they, they were expecting the Messiah. And they would have concluded that this John must be that Messiah. But friends, that was a faulty understanding of who the person of John was. And this also extended into the church as it spread forth. Uh, Some of the the Jewish people uh, who would come to know Christ were even somewhat confused about the role of John. And this would have even reached the city of Ephesus where John is writing this gospel as well. As you remember, a man by the name of Apollos in Acts 19. Uh, This was a man that was regarded to only know of the baptism of John. And so the apostle John confronts it heads on. 
that John was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. He came to bear witness. So friends, John's audience, the people that he was writing to, needed to get their eyes off of John and onto John's testimony. And they needed to respond in faith through his testimony. As it says as well here, that all might believe through him, right? Not believing in him, in John, but through John's testimony. And friends, that's what, the, that's what a prophet does. A prophet was never used by God to draw attention to himself. A prophet was never to be the focus. A prophet was to be an agent of God, a witness of God, so that people would believe not in them, but through them to God. That they were not to be receivers of someone's faith, but to be conduits through which faith flows. It's the classic prophetic preaching of the truth, where the prophet stands aside and points to the one who is to be worshipped. The purpose is to draw your eyes and your hearts forward and upward to Jesus Christ so that the day when the Savior would come, that you would be looking for Jesus. And so as John was this last and greatest prophet, even as Jesus himself referred to John in Matthew eleven eleven as the greatest prophet, John stands here at the closing of the biblical era of the prophets how do we know that? Well, Hebrews 1, 20, or Hebrews 1, 2 says, and we read this last week, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So John's testimony here stands as a representation of all of the prophets' testimony that their time was over because in these last days, God has spoken to us, again, through his word, through his son, Jesus had to come, the word had to come, and the light has come. And so we have to get it straight. John was pointing us to Jesus, bearing witness to the light. And so for John's audience, and for us, this just highlights all the more, friends, that we need to accept John's testimony. We need to accept and believe the prophetic testimony of the word of God. We need to heed the scripture's testimony of the Old Testament as it stands as a witness to Jesus Christ that we must respond to the testimony. Friends, the Old Testament book that you, you have in your hands that takes up such a major portion of your Bible, it's not just a collection of histories and genealogies and moral stories. The Old Testament you have all bear witness to the light. It all bears witness to Jesus. It's all pointing to him. You know, even as Jesus would explain to the Pharisees in, in John 5, 39, he says to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Even as Jesus explained to his disciples on the road to Emmaus after he uh, rose from the grave, it says in Luke 24, verse 27, he says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, right, the Old Testament, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Friends, this book is all about Jesus. It's all a testimony and so as we're looking at John's testimony, we believe in John's testimony. As we look at the Bible, we believe in the prophet's testimony. And we need to rightly respond to the testimony by believing in this Jesus that it's all pointing to. Friends, you can't believe in Jesus just by looking at a rock. You can't believe in Jesus just by studying the stars. You can't believe in Jesus by, through logic and reason alone. You cannot believe in the true and saving light through any other writings or any other testimonies or any other belief system in the world. You need to believe the testimony that is before you. Right? We're not all getting to the same end through different means. That's not how it works. There's only one way 
And that's as revealed through Jesus Christ, through the very word of God. You need to believe in the testimony. You need to accept it. We need to believe in the true light. That's where John goes next here as you look down to verse 9 to 10. He says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Yet the world did not know him. Friends, to rightly respond to the true light means that you must also resist your carnality. You must also resist your carnality. Now, as much more is going to be said about John the Baptist to come, the apostle turns back the focus to the main thing. He turns the focus back on Christ, the true light. That as Jesus is the true light of men, the true light that shines in the darkness that it was his coming to earth, his coming into the world, his long expected arrival that the prophets were so anticipating that even as we just finished studying through some of Genesis and we were studying the, the covenant promises of Abraham in Genesis and how there was this promise, this covenant promise that as, that as the nations are going to be blessed through his offspring, we know that the ultimate fulfill, fulfillment of that is Jesus Christ. We also know in the, the, the writings of Isaiah as well, the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 49.6, God says, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That's speaking about the Savior, a light for the nations. Friends, this, this true light that John is talking about here is the fulfillment of that light. It's the true light which gives light to everyone, to, to all the nations, to the ends of the earth. And as you see this language of him coming into the world, we see a lot of emphasis here on the word world. In fact, we see the word world being used four times. He was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Friends, John is emphasizing the world here. What we see John doing is making a very strong point. And the point is, is that as much as Jesus was that long prophesied light given to bless all the nations, given to bless the whole world, the reality of his coming, his incarnation, his being in the world, didn't result in the whole world believing in who he truly was. Now, even as the world was made through him, John says, speaking of Christ's ownership and care, the fact that everyone owns their existence to Jesus, according to the, the apostle John here, by and large, the world didn't know him. In fact, this word gnosko, to know, if you have an NIV in your hands, this is translated that they didn't recognize him. The world didn't recognize their need of him. They didn't recognize their absolute desperate need of Jesus. Leon Morris says this. He says, the world missed its great opportunity. It did not come to know the word, the word when the word was in their very midst. The world did not know him. The, the world never does. The world's characteristic reaction to the word is one of indifference. This not knowing. They missed him. But this, this knowing is also, there's a willful part of it. There's a responsibility in this. There was a, there's a willing indifference here as well. A, a willing rejection of Jesus. And isn't that the truth? That when the greatest news that could ever be heard and seen just bounces off the forehead of the world. Friends, there is a reason that the characteristic of the world is one of indifference, of unrecognition. And it's precisely in this use of the word world four times. John's emphasizing a massive problem with humanity, a massive problem that plagues us to our very core. The problem that as, as the world is so entranced 
by the world that they couldn't even recognize the greatest joy and hope ever. Even though he was right in front of them in the flesh, they didn't know him. They didn't recognize him. And so the world doesn't see him because the world can't see past its own nose. They can't see the light because the world is like an eclipse in front of the sun. Because all the world wants is to see itself. John Piper puts it this way in his his book, Hunger of God. He says, if you don't feel strong desires for the manifestations of the glory of God, it's not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It's because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things and there's no room for the great. And friends, that's the truth of Jesus' coming and his being in the world. You'd think that as the world would see all of his miracles, all of his incredible teaching and his passion, that they would just be coming in droves to worship him as God. But no, that's not what you see. That's not what you see in the scriptures. Yes, many were fascinated by him. But it was only just a few who stayed with him until the end. Even though those crowds would press in because they wanted to see a miracle. They wanted to receive healing. Even though the the thousands would be fed by him, the reality is is, is that when they were called to believe in him, they didn't believe in him. And they, in fact, would leave him. As we're going to go into John chapter 6, verse 66, it says this, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. It was a hard teaching. Jesus was teaching them the hard truth of the gospel, what it means to follow him. And as much as they loved the miracles, that they loved all of the the fantastic things that he was doing, when it came to believing and following, they no longer walked with him. In fact, as you look at the very end of his time on earth, Just after he ascends back to heaven, the book of Acts records this in chapter 1, verse 15. It says, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, and the company of persons was in all about 120. Right? Not millions, but just a few in comparison. And so by and large, friends, the the world doesn't know him because the world doesn't want to know him. We don't want to know him because of our own worldliness and our carnality, our love of ourselves. And friends, this is the spiritual epidemic that has infected the whole world in its sin. That as John mentions here that the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. The world doesn't know him because we've exchanged the truth about him for a lie. Romans 1.25 talks about that, right? Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And the result is this. And we worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Friends, that's what we do naturally. We tend to worship creation. We tend to love the world to the point that we cannot see the greatest thing ever. Even though he's standing right in front of them. Anybody wish they could actually see Jesus standing right in front of them right now? Right? If I could just touch him, if I could just see him, then I would believe. Then I truly believe. But the truth is, friends, is while he was in this world, in the flesh, they saw him, they touched him, they heard him, but many did not believe him or believe in him. Like Demas, who was so in love with the world that he deserted Paul, Friends, our natural bent is towards the world, not to Jesus. And so, friends, we need to ask ourselves, what are we loving about this world that is eclipsing the glory of Jesus Christ? What are we wanting to worship here? What is blinding our hearts and our minds towards Jesus? What's getting in the way of us truly understanding and seeing him for all that he is. Even as Christians, the old man rises up. Right? Fleshly things, worldliness still exists amongst us. 
We're prone to running to worldly things that steal our affections away from Jesus. And so for for you Christians, what temporary functional gods are you still prone to running to? What things are we still running to in the flesh that, that eclipses the glory of knowing Jesus Christ? What gets us off track? Friends, by the negative example of the world here, we must resist our carnality. We must resist our bent towards putting the world in front or putting ourselves before Jesus, right? Our God who created us and sustains us and loves us, our God who came down to save us while we were yet sinners, while we didn't deserve it. Friends, what are we putting towards him, even as Christians? As the world and the flesh and the devil are against Christ, friends, we're called to resist this in the strength of the Spirit, to know Jesus and to know him all the more. John's going to write about this later in chapter, or sorry, in his his epistle, 1 John 2.15. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Friends, we need to resist our carnality. We need to know Jesus, know the real, true light, Jesus. Now, as our carnality can blind us from seeing the true light, the next thing that John touches on here is our propensity as well to trust in our religiosity. It says, Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Friends, to rightly respond to the reality of Christ, you must also reject your religiosity. Now, where am I getting that from? Well, again, as the text says, Jesus came to his own and his own people did not receive them. Let me ask you, who who are his own? Who were the people that he came to? His people. Well, unlike the world, who likely never heard anything about Jesus before he came, his own here are, are the Jewish people. They are the Hebrew people, the ones who would have, if they've studied the scriptures for all that it's worth, they would have heard about Jesus, about the Messiah who was coming, his own people. These were the people who had the very covenant promises of God. This is the nation of Israel. These were the ones to whom the Messiah was prophesied to come. The ones who had the testimony of the prophets. They had the scriptures. They had the Old Testament. And it is so loaded with prophecies about Jesus. The Old Testament is so loaded with types and shadows pointing forward to Jesus. The very Bible, the word of God is full of the promises of a coming prophet, priest, king, Suffering servant, Messiah, Savior. They had all of that. His own had all of that. But as he came to his own, his own also wouldn't know him. They, in fact, would reject him. They didn't know the one who God was revealing from all the way back in Genesis 3 that, that, that this Messiah is going to come. He's going to be wounded, but he's ultimately going to crush the head of, of the serpent forever. He's the one who through every text and every story and every piece of wisdom and poetry in the Old Testament is just dripping and aching for resolution of a savior. And he has finally come. He's finally come to his own people, his chosen people, but they reject him. Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Notice it doesn't say that they didn't know him. It says that they didn't receive him, which in the negative really means that they rejected him, right? As Pilate himself would ask the Jewish people, Jesus's own people, whether they would want to save him or this murderer, Barabbas, what did they do? They chose Barabbas. As John is going to show us in chapter 18, 40, in Jesus's passion and in his death, They cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. They chose a murderer, an insurrectionist. 
right? Because that's what they preferred. Because they hated this Christ. They hated Jesus. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. They rejected him. And friends, this is the greatest scandal that ever took place. That as the Jews had everything they had to believe in Jesus, they chose, by and large, to reject him. And so again, you wonder, how could they have done this? How could they have missed this? Jesus fulfilled over 300 plus really clear prophecies in the Old Testament. So what gives? How could they miss it? Well, again, as, as Jesus argued with the Pharisees, about their religiosity, he said to them, again, in chapter 5, verse 39, he said to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. They're looking to their writings as that is salvation, but the, the writings are pointing to Jesus, and they missed him. Friends, the reason that his own did not receive him is because they loved their religion. They loved their propensity to try to be good enough, to try to do enough good things so that I could be accepted by God. They loved their laws and they kept writing more and more rules because they loved their religiosity and they loved their religious system. Friends, his own didn't receive him because his own received a false religion in its place. And there was no room for Christ in that. No, they were trusting in their own flesh. They were trusting in their own rules. They were trusting in their own perceived righteousness. And friends, when you do that, when you do that, there is no room for Jesus. And you cannot receive him. There's there's no room for Christ when you and your rules are your own savior. When your flesh is perched upon the throne of your heart, there's there's no room for Jesus. You will not receive him. Paul argues this in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 and 7 and 8. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's that's speaking of their religiosity, trying to earn it for themselves. Religiosity is is all about setting your mind on the flesh and what you think that you can do to earn God's favor, to earn God's grace. Whether that means that like the Jews, you're trying to keep the law of God or you're trying to be good enough to be accepted by God. Friends, that is the falseness of every religion across our planet apart from biblical faith. That we believe naturally that we can do enough, we can keep enough, we can be good enough. But friends, that is not the gospel. The gospel is that you could never do enough. You could never be good enough, right? Because we're not good, right? Romans 3, 10 to 12, it's written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And none of this should be new for the Jews. All of that is Old Testament reference. Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. Amongst numerous other texts in the Old Testament that speaks about their inability and depravity. Friends, as John is highlighting Christ coming into the world and coming to his own, the fact that we couldn't save ourselves is the whole reason Jesus had to come. That it was the reason precisely because we couldn't keep God's law perfectly. But Jesus did. We couldn't love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, but Jesus could, and he did it perfectly. He came precisely because they couldn't sacrifice enough lambs and goats and bulls to atone for their sins. That's why he had to come. That's why when John is going to see Jesus in the, in the chapter to come, what's he going to say? He's, he's going to say, he's the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. 
He came precisely, friends, because we couldn't be holy as our heavenly father is holy. As hard as the Jews tried and and as hard as you and I try, we could never do it. No, friends, the truth is, is that you need the righteousness of another. We needed the very righteousness of God. That's why the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's why light had to come into our darkness. That's why he came into the world and he came to his own. Friends, the right response to Christ here is to reject your religiosity. Right? That's our tendency to try and earn God's favor, to try to earn enough righteousness to work our way back to God. No, Christ came precisely to do what you could never do. He lived the perfect righteous life in order that he would cover you with his righteous robes so that you can be accepted by God. And so the question is, is, do you believe that? Are you trusting in that alone? Or are you trusting in your own religiosity? And so in light of that reality, friends, with the responding to his testimony and the resisting of our canality, we need to reject our religiosity. Even as Christians, we can run to false systems the false gods, right? If I can just do this and this and this for my children, then they're going to be saved. We're not guaranteed that. If I can just be good enough, maybe God will accept me. If I can just take enough sacraments and earn some righteousness, then maybe I'll be accepted by God. Friends, our bent is towards religiosity We can't do enough. Christ had to come, and he did it. And so we need to receive him. We need to receive his righteousness. But the only way that you can truly believe and receive Jesus is point number four, to receive him by the new birth. To receive him by the new birth. And that's where John goes. We're going to see a lot of this in the Gospel of John. He says in verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Receive him by the new birth. To truly believe and receive Christ, to truly become a Christian, And to be saved from your sin, to be saved from your hell, to truly be reconciled to God, to truly be set free from your sin so that now you can truly love him and serve him and worship him means you need to become a child of God. And the only way that you can become a child of God is to be born of God. And that comes through the new birth. Friends, as as all of us are born spiritually dead, Ephesians 2 Your only hope is to be made alive by God, to be reborn by God, and then to be adopted by God into his family as his very child. And friends, that's the gospel. No one is a child of God naturally. No one is a child of God by blood, specifically speaking about the religiosity of the Jews who believe salvation came through their lineage, through their bloodlines. No, John completely rejects that altogether. He says, born not of blood, speaking directly of them, but also of us. Friends, just because they were Jews didn't mean that they automatically went to heaven when they died. No, they, like us, needed to be born again. As they were prone to trusting in their religious external uh, sacraments and, and for example, circumcision, true salvation would only come through the inner circumcision. In fact, this is an Old Testament truth. Deuteronomy 36 says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. It's not about external. 
It's not about the cutting off of some flesh. It's about the the heart being reborn, regeneration, salvation by rebirth. That's when God comes in and he removes that heart of stone, Ezekiel 36. And he gives you a heart of flesh and he puts his spirit within you. Friends, that is the only way. It's not by outward efforts. It's about inward regeneration. As John goes on to say, born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, friends, you cannot muscle your way back to God, nor of the will of man. You can't will your way there. You don't have that power. But of God, it says. Friends, the truth about salvation is that there is nothing within the human ability or initiative or will that can save you from your sin. It's only found in the initiative of Christ's blood through his will, through his flesh, that could ever save anybody. And so as we respond here to the testimony of John as he's front-loading this, the eyewitness, bearing witness of who Jesus is, as John the Baptist sits on the witness bench, we accept his testimony. We believe it. Friends, we've got to resist that carnality, that, car- that carnal bent that we have to love the world over God. And then in that, we need to reject our religiosity, that, that what we want to do is we just want to work our way there. And all we can do before God is ask for him to make us alive. Ask for God to give you new birth. You need to be born of him. You need to be adopted by him. And so it's the gospel that John is going to be so full of, of, of a sovereign God who, who loves the world and sends his son. He is a God who saves. He is sovereign over that salvation, and he is sovereign to keep you. It is all of God. As we examine ourselves, let us see where we've been running from him. Let us see where we've been rebelling against his word. Let us be aware of how we're sinning before his face, how we're loving the world over loving him, trusting in our flesh over trusting in him. And friends, we must repent of all of this. And we must confess to the Lord our desperate need of his grace to save us. And in that, would you ask the Lord as well to make you new? Ask the Lord to give you new life. Ask to be born of God, that you would then receive Jesus and you could believe in the name of Jesus so that you would have the right to become a child of God. The Jews thought they had the right 